Abraham the Moabra discovered the fit of the bell cap, the normal, that we've walked our way through pictorially. He did this in 1733, in the 50 years after the dawn of the calculus. You must understand that at this time, there were no fancy displays that he could look to, no simple computations on a desktop computer to churn through numerically these distributions. So the investigations inevitably had to be done by hand, abstractly, analytically. It is all the more remarkable that such a beautiful and elegant realization came to the fore. The Moivre wrote about the normal approximation to the binomial in 1733. The Moivre worked with a fair coin. P is equal to one half. It took a full 80 years before the idea was generalized and the next step was taken. And this was taken by Pierre Simon, Marquis de Laplace, and in 1812, he showed that this realization of the Moivre extended seamlessly even if the coin was bent. In other words, even if the success probability P was not one half. And this led to this epochal theorem that today we call the result of the Moivre and Laplace. So let's start with the setting. So, our basic setting is that of repeated independent trials, and to begin, we are going to deal with the tosses of a coin whose success probability is some value p between 0 and 1. So in other words, x1, x2, x3, xn, and so forth, constitute Bernoulli trials with success probability p. We're naturally interested in the accumulated number of successes, s sub n, so for every n, s sub n is a sum of the x's from 1 through n. And we know that for each n, sn is now governed by a binomial distribution with two parameters, the number of trials n and the success probability of the coin p. Our experience with the fair coin suggests that we should promptly to view the sn's holistically across n, we should center the distribution at the expectation and scale it so that we are looking at a unit scale, in other words, a dimensionless problem. Accordingly, we form in the proper scale a new variable for each n, Sn star, centered at the origin by subtracting from Sn its expected value and scaled to have unit spread by dividing this by the standard deviation of Sn, or in other words, the square root of the variance. We recall that the binomial Sn has got expectation n times p, and it has a variance n times p times 1 minus p, and so the expression simplifies into this fraction. Okay. The theorem of the Moivre and Laplace deals with this normalized variable. You will admit justly that all we have done is properly centered the distribution and viewed it in the proper scale so that we could view all of them on the same framework. The, the Moivre Laplace theorem now says the following Pick any values a and b. a is less than b. We'd like to ask what is the probability that the discrete variable Sn star for a given n? lies between a and b. In other words, we want to accumulate the mass function for s and star in the range from a to b. That's what additivity tells us. The approximation by the bell curve says that the sum of those probabilities may be well approximated by the area under a bell curve, and the area being from a to b. So, that integral notation just stands for area. And if you're not familiar with the integral calculus, just think of it as an area under a given function, a given curve. We could relate this to the distribution function as follows. The area under the bell curve from A to B can be obtained first by looking at the entire area to the left of B. Of course, that's what we called the distribution function of the normal evaluated at B. 
and then take away from that entire area all the area from A to the left. And therefore, we get a simple form for this in terms of the distribution function. Big phi of B minus big phi of A. The De Morville-Laplace theorem says that the probability that a properly centered and scaled binomial lies between any two fixed values is given approximately by the area under the bell curve from A to B. And that this approximation gets better and better and better as n becomes large. Now, there are a couple of comments we need to make on this. First, I have not given you a proof of this result. And at some level, that is unavoidable. This is the first time we're going to encounter a result which is going to require more than purely elementary and easy mechanisms. There are now many proofs of this result. And I can't say that any of them is completely elementary or easy, at least as can be shown in a first year in a college class. So to get a full understanding of the subtlety and nuance of this result, we're going to need more mathematics in our armory. And I shall not dive into those waters. We'll take our pictorial evidence as compelling and take this result at face value. A second question that might come across a student's mind is, well, this is not completely satisfactory, perhaps, because on the left is a probability I would like to evaluate, a probability involving the accumulated successes in the tosses of a coin, a probability involving a binomial distribution. On the right, I've got an asymptotic statement which says that if the number of trials becomes large, then we get a behavior of a certain kind, a limiting behavior. A question naturally then is, well, how large does it have to be before this approximation is good? Or another variation on the same theme, for a given n, if we approximate a binomial probability by this area under a normal curve, how much error do we make? Perfectly legitimate questions and important. And again, let me fob this off by an empirical observation, which can be supported by some theory. The asymptotics in these settings kick in very, very, very fast. A typical rule of thumb is to say that if n is around 30, you already get very good approximations, typically. It also depends upon how skewed the coin is. The closer the coin is to being fair, the quicker the approximation kicks in. The more skewed the coin is, the smaller p gets or the larger p gets, the more skewed the underlying binomial distribution and the longer it takes for the normal approximation to kick in. But even in extreme cases, generally the approximation kicks in very, very fast. By typically around 100, we should see very good fits to the underlying probabilities. Another rule of thumb is to say, well, if n times p or n times q is bigger than 5, then we should get good approximations. And indeed, we do. Instead of delving deeper into the quality of approximation, which inevitably is going to get us into an algebraic morass, let us be satisfied with a slogan. Okay. To wit, that binomial probabilities viewed in the proper scale and properly centered are governed approximately by the area under a bell curve, even for modest values of n.